welcome to the comparative literature luncheon. Before giving the introductory duty, Bob Edwards, the head of our department, I'd like to announce a few events that are forthcoming. First of, first of all, the speaker for the next luncheon on the 12th of March, right after the spring break, will be Paul Johnson, professor at the University of Michigan. He will speak on an automaton inferiority at G in Brazil, 1896. On Wednesday this week, Steve Maxson at the Washington Post will speak on the main media at 11.15 a.m. in 012 Katz Building. Also on Thursday this week at 4 p.m. Uh, in the Patano Library in the room 18103, Francis Aparicio, professor at Northwestern University, will give a talk on narrating intralatex lives in Chicago, gender and national disidentifications. And one more thing, the most important thing tonight, <laughs> welcome party for prospective graduate students will be held uh, at 7 p.m. in Rose, Jory's place. And everyone is welcome. And her place is 345 Bridge Avenue. This is walking distance, 10 minutes from Barrows and five minutes from here. So please try to walk. There are a lot of food and drinks, so you need to exercise. Parking <laughs> <laughs> yeah, space is so limited. Everything, everyone is welcome. Okay, so now Bob will be introducing us today's distinguished speaker. <laughs> Don't let this woman out of the room. <laughs> right? yeah, that one doesn't go in. <laughs> That's why we organize these. Well, I, I want to welcome our visitors and thank our graduate students who have been such good hosts over the weekend. Uh, some of you had the good luck to uh, wander into a graduate. Uh, student conference that uh, was, again, was really terrific. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of our grad students put effort into that as well. But I'm grateful too to our faculty who've been meeting with uh, all of you and uh, giving you a sense of what our program is like. Um, one of the best ways to show what we do in comparative literature at Penn State uh, uh, is to uh, uh, capture faculty scholarship uh, in the wild, in <laughs> real time, as it were. Uh, we're fortunate to have our colleague, uh, Magali Aramis Tissera, uh, speaking today at the Confident Luncheon. Magali com completed her PhD in comparative literature at New York University, uh, taught at the University of, of Mississippi, and held a research fellowship at the Humanities Center at the University of of, of Pittsburgh. Um, she joined our department in 2005. Mugley's work on the Global South, that is, on the cultural political formation linking states and regions outside the traditional categories of North, South, and developed and Third World, has added an important dimension to our intellectual work. She has had articles published or forthcoming in Latin American Literary Review, the Cambridge Journal of Postcolonial Literary Inquiry, Research in African Literatures in Hispanica, and PMLA, as well as essay collections on the Global South Atlantic and Unmasking the African Dictator, essays on postcolonial African literature. Her first book, The Dictator Novel, Politics and Writers in the Global South, is forthcoming from Northwestern University Press. She is the co-editor of Global South Studies, a digital platform for scholars in the field that is maintained by the University of Virginia through the Mellon Global South program. Uh, Magali has also organized a major conference devoted to thinking of the Global South, which will be held here at Penn State on March 16th and 17th. 
Her talk today is Mes Aventures, The Politics and Poetics of the Dictator Novel in the African Post Column. Excellent to you. Thank you. I feel like calling this scholarship in the wild um, really dignifies what scholarship in the wild actually looks like. I'm wearing pants, which is different from how things usually look when I'm doing scholarship in the wild. Um, my talk today is drawn from the fourth chapter of my book manuscript, The Dictator Novel, Writers and Politics in the Global South. And I'm going to begin by saying a few words about the larger project. I'm also uh, <coughs> taking the opportunity to try out Prezi for the first time, and hopefully this will make everyone as motion sick as it Ooh. usually makes me and try to minimize the uh, animation. So the book is a comparative study of novels about dictators in Latin American and African literatures. That is, Novels in which the dictator is a character in the text, up to and including serving as a protagonist through whom parts of the narrative are focalized. I distinguish the dictator novel from the broader category of novels about dictatorship, which focus on the effects of living under authoritarianism on the lives of individuals or families, where the family unit often stands in for the nation as a whole. My project brings together a cross-regional and multilingual archive that spans the textual cultures of post-independent Spanish America and 20th century Hispanophone Latin American literature, with a specific focus on the boom in the 1960s and 1970s, through to the emergence of the dictator novel in the post-independence Anglophone and Francophone African, uh, in post-independence Anglophone and Francophone African literatures and its evolutions after the end of the Cold War. Not only do these two continents, Latin America and Africa, share a history of post-independence authoritarian regimes, what we might call an initial premise for comparison, they've correspondingly rich regional traditions of literary engagement with the dictator and dictatorship at large. Reading the dictator novel in this transhistorical and transgeographical perspective shifts emphasis away from the possible historical reference of a work. So the question of which regime or which dictator is the object of critique to the unifying concern of the dictator novel as a genre of cause, place, and time. I track the dictator as a literary figure, the representation of which is characterized by a constellation of shared tropes, themes, and critical motifs. The dictator novel in this reading is not simply a response to a national political question or a regional phenomenon, but a transnational literary genre. Understanding the dictator novel as such requires reading across often asynchronous political and literary histories. In Latin America, the tradition of writing about and against authoritarian regimes stretches back to the political turmoil that followed independence in the early 19th century. Here, to talk about the dictator as a problem of national formation was also to talk about the desired political community of the new nation. Although these conversations were initially dispersed across a variety of narrative and non-narrative genres, including essays, poetry, and so on, in the early decades of the 20th century, the novel emerged as a primary venue, and the dictator is a key figure for understanding Latin American reality. On the other side of the Atlantic, the dictator novel emerges in West and Central African literatures in the 1970s and 1980s as a subset of the broader category of novels of political disillusionment, which followed the anti-colonial and nationalist literature of the independence period. In these texts, the dictator is placed alongside a larger complex of issues that includes the lasting effects of colonization, or rather its afterlives, the forces of neocolonialism, and the collaboration of what Franz Fanon would call the national bourgeoisie with those external interests. All of these are also characteristics of what Ashimbembe would later term and theorize as a post-colony, hence its presence in my title. Chapter four is really the comparative hinge of the larger book project. And I'm using the term hinge here both in the practical sense of the movable joint that links together two parts, as well as in the sense of the central point or principle on which my larger argument depends. Chapter four is where I move from the Latin American dictator novel and its criticism to the dictator novel in Anglophone and Francophone African literatures, right? And in that sense, it's the joint that, joint, the joint that brings together two parts. This is a delicate maneuver which gets to the central point or larger aim of my argument in this book. So, <laughs> move one. 
Um, the histories of post-independence dictatorship in Latin America and Africa have long invited analogy, and Fanon provides one useful example. Les Dames de la Terre, or the Wretched of the Earth, for instance, Fanon warned against the danger of newly independent nations in Africa descending into dictatorship, invoking what he called, quote, the short-sighted fascism that is trying for half a century in Latin America as a cautionary example. The comparison of African countries to Latin American countries is repeated at several key parts in the book, particularly where Fanon links his arguments to the challenges facing the third world more broadly. Fanon's comments then, open a comparative itinerary for thinking about the dictator novel on both sides of the Atlantic. But to begin with the notion of a shared history can be risky, because what is at best analogy might easily be taken for an assumed equivalence between the texts, if not their political histories. My book does not postulate, nor do the texts themselves sustain, a genealogical relationship between the dictator novel and Latin America and Africa. Right? So I'm not saying that it's born in Latin American literatures and then at some point between the 60s and 70s travels to Africa. Examples of transcontinental influence or illusion do exist, as I'm going to touch on toward the end of my talk. However, these are less proof of traveling or borrowing than instances of repurposing that expand the representative grammar and critical vocabulary of the genre. Paradigms of importation or imitation do not sufficiently explain the occurrence of this type of novel in African literatures, nor are they able to account for the variations introduced in the works by African writers. The challenge then is really a question of method, of how to read comparatively across Latin American and African literatures without subordinating one to the other. This is important not just in order to avoid a common pitfall in the study of African literatures in particular, which is the tendency to treat these literatures as interchangeable with those of other regions in the global south, such that any critical paradigm could be made to apply relatively easily, but because influence and exchange are actually only part of the story. As I argue in chapter four, the dictator novel has what we might call, for lack of a better term, local origins in post-independence African literatures. Only later does it enter into some dialogue with the Latin American dictator novel, engaging with and reworking the expectations associated with those texts. It is therefore, in reading for the differences, as much as the similarities or coincidences, which would be the stock and trade of comparison, the theorization of the dictator novels of international literary genre becomes possible. And in the larger book, I talk about this using uh, Jameson's idea of a generic series as a way of theorizing genre. The remainder of my talk is going to unfold in three parts. First, I'm going to briefly set up the background and stakes of the chapter. Second, I will discuss a series of three works by Chino Achebe of Nigeria and Usman Simbin of Senegal, respectively, through which, in the chapter, I chart a movement from the broader concerns of the literature of disillusionment to the specific focus on the dictator. This is effectively the emergence of the dictator novel. Finally, at the close, I'm gonna to touch on two um, moments in which I'm gonna to touch on some examples in which two Congolese works consciously engage and play with elements from the Latin American dictator novel. So part one, Mes Aventures, uh, The Misaventure of Independence and the Literature of Political Disillusionment. In Lexa Caira's novel, The Detainee from 1974, an old man attempts to make his way from his remote mountain village to the city for medical treatment. But the country is paralyzed. The buses do not run, mandatory party membership cards are frequently checked, and everywhere there are bands of the fanatical young brigade who demand declarations of allegiance to the dictator, Sir Zadok Mingo, doctor of laws and Africa's greatest son. Eventually, the old man is placed in a prison camp. He escapes when one of the guards tries to kill him, is found in the forest and mistaken for dead, taken to the morgue. This Kafkaesque novel ends with the old man regaining consciousness in the morgue and fleeing back into the forest. As one character remarks in the course of a conversation about Sir Zadok's regime, independence, what independence? Written almost two decades later, Wahome Mutaki's Three Days on the Cross from 1991 similarly charts the arbitrary injustices and pervasive paranoia of life under dictatorship. Members of the various police and security forces carry out escalating violence and really torture in the name of a faceless dictator referred to simply as the illustrious one. The cover really says it all in terms of condensing the plot. Um, as in the detainee, three days on the cross is permeated by the sense that decolonization has failed. Neither work is, properly speaking, a dictator novel because the dictator is too far removed from the lives of the protagonists and the events in the plot. 
These are what I earlier called novels of dictatorship. But as works concerned with the frustrated promise of independence, the detainee in Three Days on the Cross are representative examples of the raw material out of which the African dictator novel coalesced. Here, let me return to Fanon <clears throat> and his thinking about the possible futures that awaited newly independent African, newly independent nations on the African continent. In the chapter, Mes Aventures de la Conscience Nationale, alternately translated as Pitfalls or The Pitfalls of National Consciousness by Constance Farrington in 1965, or as The Trials and Tribulations of National Consciousness by Richard Philcox in 2004, Fanon identified as a central concern the unpreparedness of the national elite to take the reins of government, an issue compounded by this, that same elite's lack of practical ties to the masses. Under such conditions, Fennel anticipated, the elite would quickly align themselves with foreign interests, becoming agents of neocolonialism. In the face of rising dissatisfaction, the dictator would emerge as a vital tool for mollifying or, together with the army and with the support of shadowy, shadowy foreign advisors, silencing the masses. These are what Fanon, in this chapter and in the larger work, terms mes aventures tragiques, or the sort of tragic trials and tribulations of independence. As indicated by the various English renderings of Fanon's title, mes aventures has proven an elusive term in translation. The English misadventure and its correlates misfortune, captured in that phrase trials and tribulations, or mishap, as in pitfalls, are incongruous with the gravity of Fanon's subject matter. But the choice of mes aventures and the implication of adventure contained therein are crucial to understanding Fanon's argument. Well, what Fanon anticipates or describes in this chapter in many cases came to pass, prescience should not be mistaken for prescription. What Fanon described was one possible set of outcomes within a much more capacious understanding of the potential of independence, decolonization, and in that larger frame of wretched of the earth, collaboration within the third world. I've taken the untranslated term in my title, then, in that same spirit, preferring its capaciousness to the teleological arc of what in the critical literature is most often termed disillusionment. There's a kind of inevitability in discussions of the disillusionments of independence that I'm trying to get around here. The African dictator novel is both a literary response to these misaventures, specifically, of course, the rise of authoritarian regimes, and itself a kind of misaventure as a deviation or unexpected set of outcomes when viewed within the framework of the dictator novel that is the occasion for my book. Okay. Part two. Hmm. From disillusionment to dictatorship or the dictator materializes. By the very early 1960s, African writers aligned with the cause of anti-colonialism had also begun to express concerns about the political cultures that would emerge after independence. Nigerian literature provides many um, notable examples, including uh, Wale Shurenka's A Dance of the Forests uh, from 1960, a play performed at Nigeria's independence celebrations, and Achebe's No Longer Ease, also from 1960. And these early concerns, right, that are already on the eve of independence being publicly voiced, developed by the middle of the decade into open critique, as in Shurenka's later play, Kogi's Harvest, and first novel, The Interpreters, from 1965, as well as Achebe's A Man of the People, from 1966. <clears throat> The latter, a man of the people, is set in an anonymous African country where a young teacher becomes involved in the political workings of the new nation. The plot turns on petty interpersonal conflicts, greed, and sexual jealousy, where politics is displaced by questions of personal pride and individual gain. Usman Semben, who like Achebe earlier wrote anti-colonial works, similarly explored the shortcomings of the post-colonial state in two works of fiction from the 1960s and early 1970s, the first being uh, The Manda, or The Money Order, a sort of short story novella from 1965, and Hala from 1973, which is also a novella. Um, he later adapted both of these works into films, uh, Mandabi from 68 and Hala from 75, respectively. The plot of The Money Order, and here I'm talking mostly about the text, although there's interesting things to be said about what um, Semben achieves and doesn't achieve in film versus text. The plot of the money order centers on one man's attempts to cash a money order sent to him by a nephew living in Paris. Ibaki Ding is poorly equipped for the task for many reasons, but not least because he lacks the birth certificate necessary to get the national ID that would allow him to navigate the new state bureaucracy. 
After several small swindles and sort of failed attempts, he's cheated out of the money order and even his own house altogether. For all its comedy, the money order is a brutal critique of the cynicism and indifference of the post-colonial state, as well as of the haplessness and dependency of its new citizens. Hanna, meanwhile, turns its attention to the excesses of the post-colonial elite that were the focus of Fanon's attention, and specifically to a group of self-styled economic operators, as they call their um, club. <clears throat> the narrative invades against corruption, conspicuous consumption, and the, hypocr the hypocrisies of selective indulgence in quote-unquote traditions such as polygamy. The plot of this work centers on the khala, or curse, that strikes the protagonist with impotence on the night of his marriage to his third wife. Right? And the, the, the story sort of follows the protagonist trying to figure out who's put the khala on him and then trying to figure out how to undo it. Such works are all part of what is broadly termed the literature of political disillusionment, which spans the literatures of both North and Sub-Saharan African literatures in the 1960s and 1970s, really all the way up into the 90s, as is the case um, with the novel Three Days on the Cross that I talked about. Self-rule, such works assert, had not amounted to real democratization or actual freedom for the majority. The new political class, <clears throat> unsuited to the work of nation building, became willing collaborators with foreign interests. These accusatory works make recourse to parody, again, a curse that strikes our protagonist with, with impotence, satire, and even scatology, what Jed Esty has called excremental postcolonialism, to account <laughs> for the realities of the postcolonial present. The literature of political disillusionment marks a break between writers and the political class, as well as a moment of introspection or self-interrogation. And the question here really is, what exactly is the position of the writer within the class structure, and what exactly are their allegiances? Um, if initially there's some kind of identification between the elite of the new nation, writers slowly start to separate themselves from what becomes a clearly defined political class. <clears throat> By the end of the 1970s and through the 1980s, the wide-reaching concerns of the literature of disillusionment would be concentrated into the figure of the African dictator. Achebe's Antilles of the Savannah from 1987 was his first novel in the two decades since the publication of A Man of the People in 66. Um, a Man of the People ends with a fictional coup, uh, an actual coup. The first actual coup takes place in Nigeria later in 1966, kicking off the uh, Biafran War. Um, and for Achebe, this marks a real break in his novelistic production. And when he returns to the novel as a form, he essentially picks up where the narrative of a man of the people left off. I don't mean that he's picking up the same characters, but he returns to that same problem he'd been exploring 21 years before. <clears throat> Semben's Le Dernier de l'Empire, or The Last of the Empire, similarly followed a period of quote-unquote silence in which Semben had put aside literary production in order to make film. <clears throat> These novels turn attention to the head of state and his inner circle, or to borrow an image from the Uruguayan critic Angel Rama speaking about the Latin American dictator novel, Achebe and Senben enter the presidential palace and begin to sniff around its corners. This shift from generalized social critique to focus on the dictator and his cabinet modifies the critical language and concerns of the earlier works, marking a break between the literature of disillusionment and the dictator novel properly defined. <clears throat> Proximity to the dictator, and specifically the materialization as a kind of physical presence and real character in the text um, of the dictator, changes the themes and stakes of the earlier I'm sorry, changes the turns and stakes of the earlier critiques. The political function of writing and the novel form itself become a central concern. Ultimately, to jump ahead in my argument in this section, neither Achebe nor Semben finds the dictator novel to be sufficient for a thorough critique of the larger dynamics that drive and sustain authoritarian regimes. But if the dictator novel does not offer a sufficient answer, quote unquote, or response to the problem of dictatorship, it does offer the space in which each writer interrogates the project of the dictator novel itself and ideals of committed literature writ large. And this is the kind of argument that I make at a grander scale about the dictator novel as a genre in the book. Such acts of interrogation are necessarily self-reflexive, as expressed in each writer's attention to the dictator's many collaborators, the proclamations or posturing of writers nominally opposed to the regime, and the possibilities for the formation of alternate political communities. With this overview and the limits of time in mind, I'm going to look briefly at how this plays out in The Last of the Empire. So this novel 
um, is structured around a conspicuous absence. The dictator is missing. The dictator, uh, Leon Minian, also known as a venerable one, has somehow gone missing. Yet he looms over his cabinet ministers who are unsure whether the dictator's disappearance is a trap, so a trick, to see who will remain loyal, or in fact, a coup. The narrative follows their various machinations over an increasingly anxious few days as various ministers try to position themselves um, or try to get themselves into positions where they might be able to take over if, in fact, this is a coup. At the end of the novel, the dictator's simulated disappearance, it was in fact a trick, unintentionally becomes a reality when the army captures a venerable one, dissolves the government, and exiles the dictator to France with the support of the French. An issue here is not just the reliance of authoritarian regimes on falsification and simulacra, the kind of performativity of authoritarian power, but the play of representation itself. Except for Doyen Chic Tidian Salle, a longtime comrade of the Venerable One, the cabinet itself is composed of much younger bureaucrats, identified as part of the second post independence generation. While the Venerable One makes use of the differences between these generations, he and Salle are part of the first. Uh, generation post-independence and these younger men. <clears throat> well, he makes use of the differences between these generations to maintain his hold on power, in part because the younger ministers have no popular support of their own. The fluctuating forces that demarcate these constituencies pose the greatest challenge to the regime. As a journalist Gad surmises at the end of the novel, the present eventually gives way under the venerable one's feet. Initially an accomplice and later an opponent, TDN Sal serves as the primary vehicle for critique of the dictator in the novel. Over the years, as were shown through a series of flashbacks, TDN had grown increasingly uneasy with the Venerable One's concentration of power. Once the Venerable One goes missing and in a moment of frustration, TDN resigns and makes plans to write a memoir, which, as is revealed in the very closing lines of the novel, will be titled The Last of the Empire. Now, this repetition of the title of the novel is that of a fictional memoir implies an alignment of the two projects. Like the memoir, this dictator novel might serve, to quote Tidian himself describing what he hopes the memoir will be, quote, as our final statement of accounts, end quote. But there's little actual correspondence between the novel The Last of the Empire and its apparent double within the text. Although the novel contains elements of Tidian's story, its scope and frame are distinct from that of the imagined memoir. Tidian is not, in fact, a model for critical political consciousness. So even after his resignation, even after he's broken with the dictator, he remains fundamentally assim assimilationist in his thinking. He does not, for instance, repudiate the idea that African heads of state can or should hold their positions uh, for life, although he knows well enough not to say that out loud, and quickly comes to support and defend the military takeover as a kind of moment of necessary discipline, because Africans need more discipline. <clears throat> Ultimately, the novel evinces little faith in Tidian's political acuity. The repetition of the title, The Last of the Empire, within the text, therefore, actually serves to differentiate the work of the imagined memoir from that of the dictator novel. The contest is one of genre. What Semben is doing is drawing a distinction between the story of an individual life as an occasion for the drawing up of accounts with a dictator and the more complex social vision of the novel necessary for a real understanding of the phenomenon of dictatorship. Key here is the narrative device of omniscient narration, which moves through the various cabinet ministers, uh, the French ambassador, the journalist Cad, and even the dictator himself. As such, this dictator novel is not simply an enumeration of the dictator's crimes. It's an examination of the complex social and political factors that bring about and sustain dictatorship. This includes the psychological legacies of colonization, reliance on violence to gain consent, growing inequality between classes, unfettered personal greed, and the forces of neocolonialism. <clears throat> what I'm doing here is summarizing some things that Ankit Rama himself has to say about the dictator novel, <clears throat> summarizing and extending better said. Contra the memoir, which would anchor the life of the individual to that of the dictator, the dictator novel widens the perspective and therefore the critical scope of its anti-dictator project. But Senben is cautious of too hastily celebrating the critical potential of art, and this too is conveyed in the novel through metafictional gesture. At three separate points, characters refer to Senben's own work as a poet and filmmaker. The illusions initially seem playful and even winking, and serve to locate Senben himself within the novel world. But each time Senben's work is bought up, it is subject to a very clear misreading. These characters might be able to quote and even celebrate Senben's work but evidently have learned little from it. 
See, for instance, the final set of illusions, which is a conversation between the journalist Gad and one of Tinian's sons, a businessman, <clears throat> uh, named Diulde. So taking inspiration from Semben's film Hala, Diulde and his fellow businessmen have taken to referring to themselves as economic operators, altogether missing the satire in the film. The point here, one made often in dictator novels, is that art, regardless of its critical intent, remains vulnerable to misreading and misuse. And these kinds of moments of misreading are really a motif in novels about dictators. Often you'll have either a politician or the dictator himself reading a work and completely missing its point. This observation, again, um, this observation, again, repeatedly, if gently made in the novel, tempers celebration of the revolutionary orientation of a new set of actors in the novel, the youth. So it's a youth in the novel who take to the streets and perpetuate the chaos that brings about the military coup. And as the narrator explains when this is initially introduced, for the resignation of the older people, moderate and timorous, had been replaced by a new ideal, the cult of bravery, of daring, of economic and political nationalism. Their times were rich with people's heroes who had died fighting, exemplary of the same struggle being fought in many places. Their names were Nkrumah, Sekutule, Franz Fanon, Amilcar Cabral, Steve Biko, and Che Guevara, Patrice Nguma, Neto, Uncle Ho. Their spiritual capitals were Hanoi, Havana, Accra, Conakry, Alger, Maputo, Luanda, Soweto, Dar es Salaam. They expressed themselves freely and found themselves writers and thinkers near to hand on African soil. In part because the outcomes of the actions of this new group, the youth, are unresolved in the novel, the treatment of this new generation remains fundamentally ambivalent. Despite its title, The Last of the Empire does not imagine an end to dictatorship. The novel describes instead the successive transformations of systems of oppression in the decades following the end of direct colonial rule. This is why, for example, the French ambassador is an important character in the text. This is not an isolated problem. As the journalist Cad himself argues at the very end of the novel, quote, Africa will be at stake for the remainder of this century and for the first third of the next. The present struggle transcends our local problems. Now, his remarks are met with silence. He's sitting with Tidian and his family. <clears throat> but they do point to a possibly global political future beyond the scope of the novel. Potential for change, then, lies not in the critical <clears throat> intervention of a single work or a single writer, but precisely in the ability to understand that the same struggle is being fought in many places at once. Youth in and of itself does not guarantee revolutionary change. And in fact, Simbin's works, all three that I put up, are really obsessed with this idea of new generations that are merely a kind of new iteration of the problems that came before, rather than a radical break or change. But it is precisely in building transnational networks of solidarity and opposition that a new political future might be possible. calling this new vocabularies for the dictator novel. By way of closing, and to counterbalance my emphasis on the local origins of the dictator novel in African literatures, I'm going to briefly discuss instances in which <clears throat> two Central African writers acknowledged the international prominence of the Latin American dictator novel. Specifically, um, <clears throat> Gabriel Garcia Marquez's El Otoño El Patriarca, or Autumn of the Patriarch, from 1975, which was uh, translated into French in 1976, uh, particularly relevant for the examples I'll be talking about. These are Sonny La Boutonji's Les Tatonteux, or Shameful State, and Henri Lopez's Le Pour et Rire, or The Laughing Cry, from 1982. Um, and both writers are from the Republic of Congo. Continuing from my discussion of Semben's interrogation of the political function of art in his dictator novel, these novels are not just about the dictator, but about how to write about the dictator, and as such, interrogate the ends of the dictator novel as a genre. I'm going to focus on La Boutonzi, uh, in part because the connection is really quite straightforward, as you'll see in a second, but I'm happy to talk further about Lopez's novel in the Q&A. So, <clears throat> the shameful state, The Shameful State centers on Colonel Martilini, or National Lopez, a dictator nearly cliched in his violence and sexual excesses, which for the dictator novel say a lot. Um, 
As the reader is told in the opening lines of the novel, Lopez, quote, came into the world holding his big, greasy, herniated balls and exited still holding onto them. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the balls are the point of connection to Otto the Patriarch <laughs> because they are purposefully recall the herniated testicle of the general in that novel. Um, the herniated testicle of the general and Autumn the Patriarch is a defining feature, so much so that when the people enter the presidential palace at the beginning of that novel and find the dictator's body partially decomposed and covered with lichen, and one of the sort of signs by which they're able to identify him is precisely his enlarged herniated testicle. And it reappears over and over in Garcia Marquez's novel as a kind of comical motif. So, La Boutonzi <laughs> takes it and runs with it. Um, as suggested by this opening, the shameful state reads as a parody of Autumn of the Patriarch, magnifying to the point of distortion the tropes and style of its Latin American counterpart. The dictator's herniated testicles, for instance, which in Autumn were a comical detail, here become a defining and truly overwhelming feature. They are obsessively invoked, repeatedly exposed in all possible senses, and come to function as a metonymy for both the dictator and the nation state in the text, a kind of riff on the tendency of authoritarian leaders to identify themselves as a state, and also, of course, a riff on uh, Louis XIV's declaration, the date c'est moi. There's a point in the novel where the, uh, the testicles themselves seem to speak and make this declaration. In fact, there's a point quite early on in the novel in which Lopez simply, the dictator Lopez, simply points to his hernia or his herniated testicles and declares, this is where the nation begins. Um, at the end of the novel, again playing on a moment in Autumn of the Patriarch, Lopez has one of his assistants killed and served as dinner at a banquet for visiting dignitaries, including the top diplomat of the United Nations and of course, the Pope. Let me go back. This is um, what he's doing is playing um, on a moment in Autumn of the Patriarch. Um, <clears throat> so, unlike the members of the high command of the presidential guard to whom Garcia Marquez's dictator serves the former General Rodrigo, Aguilar, Rodrigo de Aguilar, these guests consume the body without noticing what they're eating. So, the presidential guard in Garcia Marquez's novel knows who they've been fed. In this case, instead, <clears throat> These foreign dignitaries have no idea what they're consuming, even though the dictator himself is walking around, giving them the food and saying, here, help yourselves, eat, this is Vauban, right? This is, this is the dead man. <clears throat> La Boutonzi here elevates the transcontinental illusion from its focus on the dictator's barbarity, which is really just the function that it serves in autumn, um, to a critique of the complacency and even complicity of the international community. The narrative voice of the shameful state, furthermore, invokes and distorts the distinctive heteroglossia and extended sentence structure of Autumn of the Patriarch, which is itself an incredibly formally difficult novel. The perspective in La Boutonzi's novel shifts vertiginously between the single and plural first person, as well as omniscient third. This is not a confrontation between the dictator or the dictator's consciousness and a collective narrative we, as is the case in Autumn of the Patriarch, but rather a cacophony of voices from which the reader struggles, and, and I do mean struggle, to glean a succession of events or really to make any sense at all. Through such exaggeration, effectively an explosion of the textual features of the Latin American precedent, <clears throat> La Boutonzi collapses existing models for the literary representation of the dictator and recasts them for a very different use in the African context. Rather than simply assimilate this Latin American dictator novel as a model, La Boutonzi pushes it to the very ends of its own logic. The result is a strange and disturbing text that offers few of the satisfactions of Autumn of the Patriarch, which themselves are kind of qualified at best. All of this serves a critical function, and its inflation of the archetype of the African dictator, uh, which effectively renders it absurd. The shameful state is also a rejoinder to the easy circulation of dictator novels on the international literary market. Indeed, critics of many stripes in many places and at many points have often worried that Latin American or African dictator novels are successful on the international literary market precisely because they satisfy existing ideas about politics in those places. By linking or rather, by first linking his dictator, uh, not coincidentally, of course, called Colonel Lopez, to the Latin American archetype, and then exaggerating both, La Boutonzi proffers a literary monster that cannot easily be read back into a specific time or place. <clears throat> 
Although a dictator novel, The Shameful State aims to make itself unreadable within the bounds of the genre, short-circuiting its capacity for international circulation. In short, and here I'm going to end, what we find in La Boutonji's work is a significant expansion of the critical scope of the dictator novel, achieved precisely through these acts of rewriting and recoding one of its most canonical works. In so doing, and to double back to the larger frame of my project, novels such as A Shameful State teach us to read, and perhaps read more carefully, those better known works. Actually, lovely, really lovely. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the grotesque and Achille in Bembe mm -hmm. and La Boutanzi. And I completely understand what you're doing in this piece, and I completely understand we're missing an entire book, which we haven't read yet. So, but just to talk, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about the ways in which Achille in Bembe talks about um, the grotesque as a mode of colloquial management of the post-colonial politic Sorry. and how that might relate to herniated bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so um, I have a lot to say at different points in the book about Bimbe's um, theorization of the aesthetics of vulgarity in the post-colony. Right, in vulgarity rather than the grotesque, I find that 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 sort of understanding of the term gets at some of its problems and its potential in interesting ways, right? So the grotesque points to Bakhtin, the carnivalesque, and so on. What the vulgarity does, what the use of the term vulgarity does etymologically is get at where Bembe goes, which is he's thinking about the intimacy. He's not just making the rather obvious statement that authoritarian regimes actually depend on the performance of vulgarity um, to, to sort of show their power, right? It's not that in calling the dictator gross, you're actually unmasking anything, it's actually part of the performance of power. But two, that this is actually part of an intimate, um, a sort of system of science in which everyone participates, right? Um, so that if there's no, <laughs> you're not doing anything by calling the dictator vulgar, it's actually the moment in which people actually try to participate sincerely, let's say, in those system of science that you can see the kind of cracks in the system. <clears throat> that is useful for me in a bunch of different ways. I find Bimbe's own readings of the literature, in part because he treats them in the same way as he uses um, actual news accounts in the chapter on the aesthetics of vulgarity, uh, weak, not particularly useful, not particularly instructive. The chapter on political cartoons is a little bit more useful for thinking about representation. La Boutonzi is working through the central points of Bembe's argument about vulgarity before Bembe even gets to it. Yeah. So to make recourse to Bembe to try to explain La Boutonzi, it's, it's useful, but it's not revelatory in any way. It's really useful to think about the aesthetics of vulgarity as they work in a Latin American dictator novel, which has a real investment in this ideal of a critical value of accusations of vulgarity, and in so doing, often misses the other sense of vulgar, which is of the people. Um, and, in, and there, this is especially clear in 19th century Argentina, in part because it's incredibly racialized. The kind of quick recourse to accusations of kind of vulgarity toward the dictator carry with them these class and incredibly racialized terms that have to do, that make clear the kind of incredibly narrow vision for the kind of post dictatorship nation that's being imagined by some of these writers. Thank you. Um, Sarah. Thank you. So I have a question that is partly just a uh, point of information, but then also are partly speculative and having to do with the historical chronology of the dictator novel. Um, and I was wondering, I know this is not something you work on, but I was wondering if there are dictator novels in Lucifer Africa, because it sort of strikes me that I, I, that's, I'm not an expert mm -hmm. at all in Lucifer Africa, but it strikes me that I don't really know of any, and those aren't the ones. That, there are plenty of novels about the sort of effects of dictatorship and you know the repressive uh, political uh, atmospheres, but obviously there's a sort of historical uh, gap there because most Muslim countries become independent later in the mid 70s, 
and of course then are sort of in the orbit of the, you know, the Soviet orbit. But I was wondering if, I mean, first of all, if you know of any dictator novels in this put Africa, and then uh, second of all, if there are really, if it isn't that important of a genre in Lisbon, Africa, if partly that has to do with uh, the historical difference and the fact that perhaps by the time uh, Lisbon, African countries are becoming independent and then they have their civil wars following that, um, if that also has something to do with the uh, sort of broader economic changes and something about the fact that later, by the 1980s, the sort of dictator is no longer does it, a useful symbolic figure for exploring these broader social and economic issues. It's just a and the short answer to all of that is yes. I mean, yes, <laughs> the ponderance of novels that have to do with dictatorship and disillusionment. Less, I actually am struggling to come up with a particular example of something that would sort of properly fit the mold of the dictator novel. And I think the reasons you speculate as to why that might be later independence, falling, coming into the orbit of of the Soviet Union, also the presence of Cuba, um, that it's sort of that these newly independent countries are actually interpolated into slightly different circuits. It doesn't mean that the questions about external domination and so on are moved, but they take on a slightly different shape. Um, what you're pointing to is sort of <laughs> chapters four, chapters four um, and five, where I look at dictator novels written in the 90s or around the turn of the 21st century that are precisely about um, I mean, exactly what you described, right? That the dictator becomes a less useful figure for talking about these problems because neoliberal globalization. Um, and, and the dictator novels you do see are actually trying to think about what, what happens to the dictator. It's all about that kind of loss of power. But the dictator novel itself doesn't have the same kind of utility, right? Unless you're just telling the story of the dictator's fault and grace uh, in that kind of change of the global system. John or Alex? Alex. Uh, I had a question about form. Um, I mean, some some of, the, uh, some of the novels you're talking about are written in a broadly realist register, mm -hmm. and uh, a number of them, and, and increasingly as you're getting later and later, they're written in a more fantastical register. I mean, you could call it kind of magical realist if you're that way inclined. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, there's a, a real, you know, the the question of the influence of the. Uh, Latin American tradition and Mark is important there. So I'm wondering how that the, those two kinds of um, formal dispositions uh, fit into the trajectory that you've described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a kind of change, right? We could say sort of novel disillusion, which is more realist. The dictator novel is less realist, maybe more magical realist. Um, I mean, the missing term there, and there's all there's a lot to be said about thinking and using the term magical realism, we're talking about African literatures, but the thing that kind of happens in between is essentially something that's not much more like what we'd recognize as postmodernism, right? Which is different from magical realism and the fantastic. So um, uh, Lopez's The Laughing Cry is the best example of real sort of textual play, the putting together of different texts, principles of pastiche, collage, the staging of different discourses. Um, <clears throat> and that's really where the kind of big break from what we could broadly call the realist novel, a realist narrative is, is actually in the, the sort of um, meta-narrative rethinking of text itself rather than the recourse to the fantastic, where I think the most radical moves are happening. Um, the Laughing Cry is starts off as these intercalated letters from the dictator's ex-butler and an exiled former minister of government who wants to use the, dictate, the butler's story about his time with the dictator as part of the political work of the opposition, and they're arguing about what that story should look like because all the butler wants to talk about is his sexual escapades, and the secretary is kind of appalled by this. But by the end of the novel, it got, kind of goes in an even weirder direction. Um, there's a multiple page quotation from Diderot's uh, Jacques, uh, the fatalist and his master, just as one example. There's then this moment where a story is told about the death, uh, coming back to the fantastic, about the death of an opposition leader and kind of straightforward realist terms, and then retold in the mode of magical realism and the performance of the master of that mode is the point. Um, so there's there's already, to the extent that the fantastic or something like Latin American realism works its way into the African dictator novel, it's very often self-conscious um, and performative. Uh, in the same, I mean, the, the, the testicles are much more obvious in the same. 
Uh, thanks so much, and I, I, I'm aware that asking a question when you come in 20, 10 minutes late is kind of, you know, a dangling testicle. Perhaps. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to come in, Alex, and again, it's based on, um, for me, the, the lens for this is something that you may have talked about in the first 10 minutes, um, which is Carpentier's Le Corso del Metro. The, which is translated as reasons of state, but it yeah. is discourse on method. Yeah. I think it's the same year, I think it's 76. It's 74. Uh, 74, okay. Um, and my question, which I'm, again, thinking at it through that, is about the form attributed to social, to political change, suggesting that maybe the opposite of a, of a you know, misadventure, is of true, is the event. Um, in the sense that is the, there's a question I think in your work as to whether forms of political solidarity, political movement, and change occur through the intermediary of institutions and forms such as literature itself, or the extent to which the dictator novel begins to register social change as like oops or as some kind of unknown that happens that is an adventure that happens to the dictatorship to, to the political regime whose means are kind of Sorelian and unknown. Mm -hmm. So like, basically I'm kind of saying, are you tracing a kind of <laughs> kind of problematic that is interested in the, the relations between a kind of Mufian um, hegemonic work on one hand and a kind of autonomous uh, Marxism on the other by means of this question of the dictator novel as the, as the mechanism for gauging what it's no longer doing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what it's no longer doing, right? I think, let's see. Answer in the language of the question, it's less that it's no longer doing something, which is to say intervening in a political process or political reality, then that's not actually its intent. Right. Um, and that its intent is a lot more like the second thing you described, which is self-interrogation and self-reflection. That um, <clears throat> as soon as the dictator is a character in the text and you are, for example, focalizing through the dictator, it opens up a whole set of other questions about the why and the how of um, how authoritarian power works. Some of it is easily diagnosable, right? The role of foreign interests, particularly in the global south, the sort of uh, foresaw processes of decolonization and so on. And others have to do with these difficult questions about authority, how authority is... Um, First of all, how authority is, let's say, composed and how it's enforced. And these very quickly become meditations on the process of writing itself. I, I, I'm covering 150 years, right? So there, there's a lot of variation within that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like really, it's, there's a lot of this in the 70s and in the 80s, and, and, and really not so much in 1845. Although there's some cool stuff in 1845. <laughs> Uh, well, this is a detail, but I would like to come back to the greasy, herniated balls that have been mentioned. <laughs> well, you projected the French original of Together with the... Yeah. And the French is very different. I yes. mean, it's neither greasy, there's no balls mentioned, it's just, so de non la hernie. So are you adding this in your English translation? It's or? not mine. It's not your translation. So, yes. Um, yes, you were right to ask the question. Um, this led me... <laughs> <laughs> Let me on a long chase looking at different ways of, um, of trying to name this thing. Uh, you know, I went to the French translation, I was trying to figure this out. So this is a, uh, I mean, the English that I quoted was from uh, Dominic Thomas's 2015 translation of the novel into English, which let's say um, front loads the association by giving this kind of imprecise translation of what's in the original French opening line. Subsequent references to the testicles make clear that that okay, is so not an invalid translation. Only they, they come later, not yeah, yeah. I mean, then mm -hmm. and and in the Spanish original as well, there's a moving between hernia, herniated testicle, testicles, but but they're all the same thing being referred to. I'm glad Dominic Thomas front loads it right. It helps me make the argument quickly. But then your observation is true. It's the kind of thing that you have that extended footnote for in the book and. Again, I'm kind of grateful that it makes my point before the point is made in the original, but it does kind of look a little off on the slide. Oh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I want to ask about readership. Mm -hmm. um, so it's obvious, you know, the important readers you talked about were the authors who are reading each other. Yeah. But uh, it's, of course, 
a classic issue in um, some African literatures that they have no, these authors have no readers in their own countries, you know, yeah. especially Lucifer, in fact. Mm -hmm. But uh, more to the point, maybe, is over time, right? Over, I mean, the, ge the general question is who is one writing for? Right yeah. beyond you know the Sartrean question, right? Uh, uh, who does one write for? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and then since you were you, you are interested in this change of form, does that accompany a change of readership? Mm -hmm. You know, are the ones that are more generalized, not the dic pre dictator novels, as it were, proto dictator novels? Are they more focused on a local readership? Uh, and the dictator mo novel, as you mentioned, more of a so do you have any information about readership in general? Yes, I do. Yeah. I mean, your point is correct, and it's not just Lucifer Africa, right? All these Francophone African novels I've been talking about are published in Paris. Mm. You know, say, say um, not, not, I mean, they're published in Paris, but to be fair, something like The Loss of the Empire is translated the next year and released in the African Writers series. So they're, they are circulating, but kind of, this gets at some of um, Jonathan's question and some of Rose's question, um, too, which is, I think that's most interesting about spending time reading the kind of correspondence or essays by authors or would-be authors of dictator novels is, is um, the ways in which they describe, if the aim of the dictator novel is to denounce the dictator, the ways in which they are frustrated by the apparent futility of the task because, and this is the connection to Rose's question, it's not like the dictators hide the facts of their dictatorship, right? Mm -hmm. He puts this as, you know, how do you like get up on the rooftop and decry the neo-slaves who are oppressing their people when both the neo-slaves are not hiding it and the oppressed people know perfectly well that they're oppressed. Um, <clears throat> which is why then the question becomes, well, okay, say, so what are you actually doing in the dictator novel? Um, a different way in which the question is posed is one of um, the apparent futility of trying to make up something when the history itself is so extreme. This comes up with African writers and Latin American writers, right? How can you compete, like Garcia Marquez has comments on this, how can you compete with the extremes of Latin American history and make something that's gonna be better or clearer in history, right? Um, than this crazy history. The answer in both, to both versions of the question is innovations in form. So yes, it's a question about publishing markets. It's also a question about language that's folded in there. And someone like Googie, who writes a dictator novel uh, in 2006, Wizard of the Crow, or between 2007 and 2004, it's published in Nikuyu, um, already in the 1980s is thinking about how a committed literature, the difference of a committed literature is not one just of language, he starts writing in Nikuyu, but also one of formal innovation, has this kind of step-by-step -step description of all the different things he does. And so it's less about, that question of who is reading you is less about trying to find, for Googie, less about trying to find material answers and thinking about, for example, the repurposing of biblical par uh, parable and figures from vernacular literature into the novel as a way of essentially breaking open novelistic discourse and making it available to a much broader audience, even if it's just through rereading, um, it being read out loud to people who are not necessarily literate. So yes, they care about it. They come up with different answers would be the short version. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much.